Good evening. I'm Jeff Bennett. And I'm Amna Nawaz. On the news hour tonight, Iran accuses Israel of striking its consulate in Damascus, Syria, a potential major escalation of the regional conflict. We speak with the former official who ran the Pentagon investigation into Havana syndrome among U.S. government personnel. And Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer on Democrats' push to protect reproductive rights in this critical election year. We know that abortion rights, reproductive rights are in threat all across the country um, as we have the prospect of a potential second Trump term. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... The ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. And friends of the News Hour, including Leonard and Norma Florfine and the Judy and Peter Bloom Kovler Foundation. Actually, you don't need vision to do most things in life. Yes, I'm legally blind, and yes, I'm responsible for the user interface. Data visualization. If I can see it and understand it quickly, anyone can. It's exciting to be part of a team driving the technology forward. I think that's the most rewarding thing. People who know, know BDO. Certified financial planner professionals are proud to support PBS NewsHour. CFP professionals are committed to acting in their clients' best interest. More information at letsmakeaplan.org. Two retiring executives turn their focus to greyhounds, giving these former race dogs a real chance to win. A Raymond James financial advisor gets to know you, your purpose, and the way you give back. Life well planned. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. For more than 50 years, advancing ideas and supporting institutions to promote a better world. At Hewlett.org. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the News Hour. There is an escalation of tension in the Middle East tonight, beginning in Damascus, Syria. Earlier today, warplanes attacked a building inside Iran's consulate complex there and killed some of the most senior members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. And tonight, there are reports of new attacks on international ships in the Red Sea and a base in southern Israel. Nick Schifrin is here now, has been following all of this. So, Nick, let's begin with Damascus. What do we know about what happened there this morning? An official with knowledge of the operation tells me that Israel attacked inside Damascus, killing three three senior Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps commanders, uh, including Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahidi. That is Zahidi there. This is the most significant strike against the IRGC since the U.S. killed Quds Force Commander Qasem Soleimani. You can actually see Soleimani there on the left in the suit. And this photo shows a lot, and this photo as well. Zahidi was extremely important to Iran's efforts in both Syria and Lebanon. That is actually Qasem Soleimani's successor right there. Uh, Zahidi was the point man with Iran backed Hezbollah, who oversaw financing in both Syria and Lebanon, uh, as well as shipments of Iranian weapons uh, into Syria and Lebanon. Uh, also killed was Zahidi's deputy, uh, Mohammed Hadi Haji Rahimi. Uh, so you see him there, uh, Haji, Haji Rahimi there. Essentially what happened today is the decapitation of IRGC leadership in Syria and Lebanon. And it wasn't only the targets, Amna. It was also the location. You see that there inside Iran's consulate in Damascus. 
That is the first time that Iranian sovereign territory inside Syria has been struck, apparently, by Israel. Now, I should say the official with knowledge of the operation told me that there, that was not a diplomatic building, uh, but nonetheless, a very significant strike against uh, Iran's longtime efforts in Lebanon and Syria. Nick, as you know better than most, there's always the concern about rising tensions, escalating violence here. Has there been any kind of response yet? By Iran, absolutely. So, as you suggested at the top, there has been confirmation by Israel of an attack uh, in southern Israel in Alat on a naval base there, believed, an Israeli official tells me, uh, believed from Yemen, from Houthis in Yemen. And we are also tracking reports both of a Houthi attack uh, on international ships off the coast of Yemen, that would be the first time in a few days, and a possible strike on Al Tamf, that is the U.S. base in Syria that has not been attacked since February. Meanwhile, we know senior U.S. and Israeli officials also met today about Israel's plans for a potential operation in Rafah in Gaza. What do we know? Yeah, so uh, President Biden's senior national security aides and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's senior uh, national security aides met virtually today to talk about this operation in Rafah. The U.S. does not want a major Israeli operation into Rafah, where some 1.4 million Gazans have fled, but where Hamas's final four battalions are hiding amongst that population uh, in Rafah. Uh, Israel says there's no way to win the war without defeating those battalions. But what the U.S. wants is a much more targeted operation. Both sides saying tonight they have the same objective, but the U.S. side expressed its concerns, and the Israeli uh, side agreed to take those concerns. Nick Schifrin with the very latest. Nick, thank you very much. Thank you. For the last decade, American diplomatic law enforcement and intelligence personnel have suffered grievous, often life-altering injuries in the line of duty. No guns or bombs or rockets were involved. Many say they felt attacked by sound. That's debilitating waves of sound and pressure that have left them with traumatic brain injuries, vertigo, and other physical ailments grouped under the government designation of anomalous health incidents. You may know it by a different name, Havana syndrome. Last evening, CBS News 60 Minutes reported more on this story and assigned blame to a foreign adversary of the U.S., Russia. For perspective, let's bring in retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Gregory Ed Green. He ran an investigation at the Defense Intelligence Agency about the sources of Havana Syndrome. He's now the founder and CEO of Advanced Echelon. That's an organization that takes care of Havana Syndrome survivors and their families and works to pursue those responsible for the attacks. Thank you for being with us. You have said that you are confident that Russia is behind these attacks. What informs that confidence? I just went off of uh, a large body of open source reporting. You can go to The Insider. They put out a great piece recently, along with Der Spiegel. Um, there's a lot of arrows pointing to Moscow right now. And I suggest you guys talk to some of the survivors, because they'll give you some very key insights into their backgrounds, what they were doing, things they were working on. It all paints a very clear picture to the layperson about who could be responsible for this. You ran the military investigation into Havana syndrome. You told 60 Minutes that the bar for proof was set impossibly high. Tell me more about that. What was the bar of proof? And what was the motivation behind elevating it, in your view? Yeah, Jeff, so I, I can't get into specifics based on classification levels. What I can tell you is that, from my perspective, uh, things and requirements from, uh, from higher levels of the government seem to change quickly. And you, you'd have to contact those officials still inside the government to figure out why they were changing certain requirements for the intelligence community. But I can tell you that this problem is not going to get better with time. We need to address it head on. And most importantly, we need to start taking care of the Havana Syndrome survivors and their families. It's about time to take action. And that time is now. As we mentioned, you retired from the Army to start a company that helps the Havana Syndrome <laughs> survivors. I imagine every case is different. Uh, but, but generally speaking, how are they faring, the folks that you work with? They're not doing well. They continue to see government products, such as the recent NIH reports or intelligence community assessments that basically gaslight them and tell them that their problems don't exist. But we've been here before. This happened with the Moscow signal for decades. This has happened with PTSD. This has also happened with Agent Orange. We need to start taking care of people that signed up to protect America. 
and America's values and their interest abroad. Because if we don't, America's eyes are going to be blinded and our ears deafened in every embassy across the globe. Our Nick Schifrin reached out to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for a response in regards to this reporting by 60 Minutes, and they directed reporters to previous remarks by Director Avril Haines, part of which read this way. Most IC, or intelligence community elements, now have concluded that it is very unlikely that a foreign adversary is responsible for the reported AHIs, anomalous health incidents. And there are different degrees of confidence associated with that. At the same time, we are going to be and continue to be vigilant about looking for information that undercuts those assumptions. What's your reaction to that statement? I would ask whoever wrote that statement to watch the 60 Minutes episode and to read the insider's <clears throat> recent reporting on it. It paints a very clear picture to most Americans, and uh, it, it also lists some clear evidence that's been uncovered with open source reporting. Do you believe the federal government is covering this up? I won't get into discussions of, of cover-ups and conspiracies, but what I will say <laughs> is that hundreds of families have been impacted, and this is also affecting our national security. It needs to be addressed. So one of the survivors who spoke to 60 Minutes, she's an FBI agent who was identified as Carrie, uh, she referred to this attack as being the result of next generation weaponry. And she said that uh, she and the other survivors, she viewed them as, as being test subjects. And yet, as I understand it, the federal government has not been able to pinpoint or replicate whatever this weapon is. Can you help us understand more about that? I believe what the survivor was referring to was a directed energy weapon. Uh, and I imagine after this 60 Minutes episode aired and recent insider reporting, there's going to be an avalanche of FOIA requests to uncover what the government knows and, and research that it's done on this, what countries are using these technologies. But one might just go to Google and search for directed energy weapons in Russia and see what comes up. You can, uh, there's plenty of examples of President Putin pending on of medals and uh, various awards to Russian scientists in the field of directed energy weapons. Look at the comments that he made in September about fielding more directed energy weapons. And also look at uh, the National Security Advisor in Moscow, what he said in the Razvedki article in uh, September of 2023 about how Moscow has successfully removed hundreds of U.S. intelligence officers from the field in the past decade. I'd like to know more about that. That is retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Gregory Ed Green. Thanks for your insights and, and thanks for your time this evening. Thank you, Jeff. Take care. In the day's other news, Israeli forces withdrew from Gaza's largest hospital, Al Shifa, after a two week battle that left much of the area in ruins. The UN Health Agency said more than 20 patients died. The Israelis denied that claim but said they killed and detained hundreds of Hamas fighters and others. By today, mangled buildings and piles of rubble spread across the hospital complex and surrounding blocks. Palestinian patients said Israeli forces allowed them only limited supplies amid the strikes. They let in a very small amount of food. We were 150 patients and 50 medical staff members. It was not sufficient at all. No treatment, no medicine, and bombing for 24 hours that caused immense destruction to the hospital. The Israeli military said some Hamas fighters had barricaded themselves inside hospital wards and others launched mortar rounds into the complex. In the meantime, ships carrying some 400 tons of food and supplies arrived off northern Gaza today. They left from Cyprus on Saturday, organized by the United Arab Emirates and a Spanish charity for the more than one million Palestinians on the brink of famine. In Israel, anti-government protesters lingered in Jerusalem today after tens of thousands turned out over the weekend. Hundreds slept in tents outside the parliament building overnight, demanding a hostage deal with Hamas and early elections, insisting that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu must go. If uh, good leaders or a new coalition is not taking over, we are doomed. We cannot imagine him not being replaced because we are... He's driving us to the abyss. All, 
Also today, ultra-Orthodox Israeli Jews protested the end of their military exemptions after an Israeli Supreme Court decision. The issue could divide Netanyahu's coalition, which includes ultra-Orthodox parties. Turkey's political opposition is celebrating sweeping wins in Sunday's local elections. The center-left Republican People's Party kept control of mayor seats in Istanbul and Ankara and even scored victories in more conservative provinces. Opposition supporters said the gains inspire hope for change, especially as the country grapples with economic turmoil. To be honest, we woke up to a good day. I believe the results will be beneficial for our country. We all live on the same land. I am sure everyone will do whatever they can for our happiness, our peace. Back in this country, the Florida Supreme Court upheld a ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. That, in turn, could pave the way for the state to enact a stricter ban after six weeks of pregnancy. At the same time, the high court today allowed a referendum on abortion rights to go before voters in November. California is drying out from destructive downpours over Easter weekend. In Big Sur, the deluge caused a chunk of the iconic Highway 1 to collapse into the sea. Some people were stranded before police began escorting them out on Sunday. Forecasters say the storm will dump more rain and snow as it moves east this week. Most fast food workers in California will earn $20 an hour after the state's new minimum wage law took effect today. California has more than 500,000 fast food workers, and many are adults supporting families in a state with a notoriously high cost of living. The law applies to fast food chains with at least 60 locations nationwide. At the White House, officials say the annual Easter egg roll brought out an expected 40,000 people, despite a delay for thunder and lightning. After that, children in raincoats and boots set to rolling their hard-boiled eggs across the lawn, and some even got a helping hand from the president himself. The tradition goes back to 1878. On Wall Street today, strong manufacturing data undercut hopes for interest rate cuts. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 240 points to close at 39,566. The Nasdaq rose 17 points. The S&P 500 slipped 10. And the last known survivor of the USS Arizona battleship, Lou Conter, has died in California. He was a Navy quartermaster when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The Arizona exploded and sank, killing nearly 1,200 sailors and Marines. Conter eventually flew 200 combat missions and survived being shot down. He was 102 years old. Still to come on the News Hour, Tamara Keith and Amy Walter break down the latest political headlines. A look at why access to government nutrition programs varies across the United States. And a Rhode Island artist fuses design and accessory, creating art you can carry. This is the PBS News Hour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. The U.S. Coast Guard has opened a temporary alternate channel for vessels involved in clearing debris at the site of the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Over the weekend, one of the largest floating cranes on the East Coast arrived to the site capable of lifting up to 1,000 tons. But before it can start removing steel and concrete, officials have difficult work, like removing a section of the steel bridge that's draped over the cargo ship. Today, Maryland Governor Wes Moore explained how large of an undertaking the cleanup is. We're talking about a situation where a portion of the bridge beneath the water has been described by, uni by Unified Command as chaotic wreckage. Every time someone goes in the water, they are taking a risk. Every time we move a piece of the structure, the situation could become even more dangerous. We have to move fast, but we cannot be careless. President Biden is expected to underscore the government's commitment when he visits the area on Friday. For more on the recovery efforts, we're joined by one of the key people in charge, 
Lieutenant General Scott Spellman, Commanding General of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Thanks so much for coming in. Jeff, good to thank see you. you for having us on the program. And if I could just begin by saying on behalf of all of the men and women in the United States Army, certainly all the men and women in the Army Corps of Engineers, our thoughts are with those families who lost loved ones in this terrible accident. We're going to do everything in our part to help the governor achieve his number one priority, which is to return those loved ones to their families. Absolutely. How are you and your team approaching the Herculean task of reopening that main channel, that main shipping lane? Walk us through the process that you've envisioned. Right. So President Biden called me shortly after the bridge collapsed and wanted us to know that the Army Corps of Engineers number one priority in this mission was to reopen that federal navigation channel. Jeff, we're really going about this in three steps. We know that channel is 700 feet wide by 50 feet deep, and we know we have a large section of steel truss bisecting that channel. We have to get that very heavy truss out of the channel, and then we have to get the concrete, the reinforcing bar, containers, any other wreckage that's at the bottom of the channel off the floor. When these ships like the Dolly come into the port of Baltimore, they're drafting 48 and a half feet. And I just told you the bottom of that channel is 50 feet deep. That's only 12 to 18 inches of clearance. And that's why it's important that we have a clean floor of that channel. And then the second step, we'll work with the Coast Guard and their, uh, their counterparts. We have to move the Dolly. That's right on the lip of that federal navigation channel. Uh, we have to refloat that vessel and get it to a safe portion of the uh, harbor. And what that will allow us to do is restore normal two-way traffic into and out of the Port of Baltimore. And then finally, we have to get the concrete, the asphalt, and the remaining structure off of the river bottom. And the, the stretch of bridge that remains draped across the cargo ship, that weighs something like 4,000 tons? That's correct. How long might this process take? Um, what we're doing right now is we're going through the math on each one of those members for that particular portion of the structure. If you can imagine each one of those beams like a rubber band, um, when we go to cut that rubber band, that steel, it will respond in the same manner. But instead of snapping like a rubber band, think of thousands of tons of force. So we want to know how it's going to behave before we put that first diver or for that first steel worker up next to that beam to make a cut. So we're doing all that math and analysis now around tables around Baltimore. And our teams are also placing gauges on all of those steel members so we understand the forces that are at play. As you mentioned, as soon as we cut one member, all of those forces redistribute and we have to go back and re-engineer and reanalyze before we make that next cut. This incident is obviously unparalleled, but are there any previous Army Corps projects that can inform the work that you need to do in Baltimore? Certainly back in 2007, the Corps was very much involved with the recovery of the I-35 collapse in Minneapolis over the Mississippi River. And we've gone back and looked at lessons learned and things that we can take forward to, uh, to this, this, this mission. But I think more recently, our ongoing recovery of the Maui wildfires, when we started off on that effort, uh, we did not know if all the casualties had been found, and it's much the same today. We know we still have four workers missing, and we have to take a lot of care and a lot of diligence into our planning. Do you have all, all of the resources and equipment that you need? We have everything that we need to accomplish this mission. Lieutenant Spellman, we appreciate uh, you coming in, and our best to you and your team there. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeff. Thank you. Since Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court, Democratic leaders have worked to protect reproductive rights in their states. In Michigan, voters enshrined abortion rights in the state's constitution in 2022. And the state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, has pushed for several reproductive rights measures. Just today, she signed new laws protecting IVF and decriminalizing surrogacy contracts in the state. Governor Whitmer joins us now. Governor Whitmer, welcome back to the News Hour. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. So uh, today's bill takes one really big step when it comes to surrogacy. It lifts a ban on compensated surrogacy that's been in place in Michigan since 1988. But there are IVF protections you also signed into law. Why were those necessary? Are IVF treatments currently at risk or under threat in Michigan? Well, we know that abortion rights, reproductive rights are in threat all across the country. Um, as we have the prospect of a potential second Trump term, we thought it was very important for us to be very clear. IVF is something that we value, that we protect here in Michigan. And we wanted Michigan to finally get on the right side of the law when it came to 
letting people create families through surrogacy. We were the only state out of, you know, in the whole nation that criminalized this way of creating a family. So in Michigan, we want Michigan women and their families to be able to decide when and if they bear a child and what way they go about creating their family. All those rights are important. I think a lot of folks will remember the February Alabama court ruling that really put IVF back in the national spotlight. But it's worth reminding folks, too, it was Republican lawmakers who stepped in very quickly to take steps to protect IVF in Alabama. And since then, a number of Republican leaders, former President Trump among them, have come out and said that they support IVF. By taking this action today, are you saying that you don't believe them? Well, listen, let me just tell you what happened here in Michigan. We put this measure before the Michigan legislature and only two Republicans voted for it. I think that's a really important message, right? When you've got the standard bearer for the Republican Party who has changed his position on abortion many times, who appointed the three Supreme Court justices that gave us the Dobbs decision and overruled Roe, we cannot trust where they are at on any of these reproductive freedoms, whether it's creating a family through surrogacy or IVF, or it is the right to make your own decisions about your body and whether and when to bear a child, or even the access to contraception. And one thing I would add too, Amna, is that we know that this extension could be applied to things like um, embryonic stem cell research. That means cures, the race for cures for things like Alzheimer's or juvenile diabetes could be impacted by this morass of what Republican policy looks like. And so the fact of the matter is we've got to secure these rights. And we wanted to be very clear here in Michigan, we protect these rights. You clearly, and other Democratic leaders also believe this is a key issue in mobilizing Democrats, also independents. You have said previously that maybe President Biden should speak about reproductive rights and should say the word abortion more frequently than he does. He's displayed some discomfort with that, changing the language even in the State of the Union to avoid saying that word. If this is such a key issue for Democrats, does his reluctance to say that word hurt him politically? Listen, President Biden is on the right side of this issue. He has undertaken every effort to protect a woman's ability to make her choices. They have worked very hard through DHHS or even their policies in other branches of government to ensure that this right is protected. And he has vowed to make sure that um, if he is given a second term, he will utilize every appointment to ensure that a woman's ability to make her own decisions and her reproductive freedom is is secure and safe. And so I've got every confidence in President Biden. And I think every one of us should be very skeptical about a possible Trump second term about what it could mean for our rights and the foundations of our democracy. We've seen that actions like the one you've taken today have helped to mobilize Democrats and independents in the past. Do you think that mobilization, especially in a state like Michigan, is enough to overcome some of the weaknesses we've seen President Biden has displayed so far, especially with those more than 100,000 people in the primaries voting uncommitted? Well, Michigan's a state where we are always going to have close elections. It's not going to be a surprise to any of us here in Michigan that this race will be close, probably close all the way up until Election Day. Um, but I will tell you, it, during my re-election, there were a lot of polls and people writing my political obituary, and I won by almost 11 points. I think it's because I stayed focused on the fundamentals that matter to the people of Michigan. President Biden has done the same, whether it is putting resources into ensuring that we are rebuilding our infrastructure, to onshoring supply chains, to making sure that people are respected and protected under the law. This president has delivered on those fundamentals, and we're going to be talking about that story all the way through Election Day. But in Michigan, elections are always close. As you know, those more than 100,000 people, though, were voting as a protest to oppose President Biden's stance in Israel, their conduct in the war in Gaza. They were doing it to send a message. I guess as, as one of the co-chairs of the Biden-Harris re-election campaign, where would you point those protesters to say they heard you, they see you? I can tell you this, recognizing that we're all human beings, the humanity and all these innocent people who are losing their lives or who are at risk of losing their lives, it is real pain, and that's something that, that I understand that I'm going to continue to work with a variety of communities in my state, keep people safe here at home, but also try to build bridges and make sure that we focus on really all the different things that are at stake in this upcoming election. 
as you know, Governor, you're seen as, as a rising leader in your Democratic Party. There was a recent New York Times column by Michelle Goldberg I want to ask you about because she wrote this. She said, quote, there are many reasons that people regularly fantasize about Whitmer replacing Biden on this year's ticket and assuming that doesn't happen, see her as a likely presidential prospect in 2028. She insists she's not interested, but few seem to believe her, end quote. I want to ask you how much of that speculation do you think is fueled by what we know is low enthusiasm and dissatisfaction for the Democratic candidate and President Biden right now? And how does that change before November? You know, I don't know. I didn't read the article. I can tell you in talking with people across Michigan, these are good, hardworking people, just like across the country. People who just want to know that their government is as good as they are, if not better, and is working as hard, if not more, than they are. And everyone wants a fair shot. And I think that's really what the Biden administration has always been about. That's what President Biden has always been about. And that's why, as a co-chair, I'm proud um, of the work that he has been able to do, and I'm proud to stand by his side as he goes for re-election. This is a, these are unique times. This is another high-stakes election. Everyone's exhausted, and yet we've all got to, we've all got to roll up our sleeves and get involved because this is going to have ramifications, not just for us today, but for generations of Americans to come. That's Democratic Governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, joining us tonight. Governor, thank you. Good to speak with you. Thank you. House Speaker Mike Johnson signals a vote on Ukraine aid will come next week, and the Biden campaign courts disaffected Republicans. It's time for a check-in with our Politics Monday team. That's Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Tamara Keith of NPR. It's good to see you both. So we just heard Governor Gretchen Whitmer talk about the Michigan Family Protection Act, which supports surrogacy and IVF and uh, LGBTQ plus parents. We've seen, obviously, reproductive rights emerge as a major driver in this election season. But this is additional action by Democrats on issues beyond abortion. Amy, what kind of impact does this have in a, in a swing state like Michigan? You know, the challenge right now that the Biden team has politically is that the people who turned out for him in 2020, many of whom were inspired, maybe not so much by Joe Biden, but voting against Donald Trump, they just are not as engaged in the election as Trump supporters are. And if the Biden campaign can give these voters, especially younger voters, a reason to show up and believe this election is important, even if they're not excited about him. I mean, in Michigan, for example, there was that big uncommitted vote um, that uh, Amna talked about with the governor. So there is certainly reticence on the part of many of these voters to show up and vote affirmatively for Biden. But by putting either issues on the ballot, which we're seeing in states like Nevada and Arizona, or making sure that this is part of the conversation, it could help to motivate some of those voters to show up, even if they're not particularly excited about Biden. This is an issue that does um, give them an incentive to go to the polls. What about that, Tam? Is this enough to bring out Democrats and independents so that Democrats can preserve that so-called blue wall? And we also learned today that abortion rights will be on the ballot in Florida in November. Right. So this bill is... In some ways, it's like a technical correction. So several of the items in it are technical corrections and, and not the kind of thing that, uh, you know, seven months from now, voters are going to be like, wow, Democrats in our state passed this thing. We are so happy. We are going to vote for Joe Biden. That is not the kind of spillover effect that I would expect to see. However, um, as the discussion about uh, reproductive rights happens all over the country, as, uh, you know, as the state of Florida is likely seeing a more restrictive ban at the same time that uh, there is now going to be a ballot measure on the ballot, this is going to be a conversation that is going to be very live all over the country. And obviously, the Biden campaign is going to make sure that, that Democratic voters know all about what's going on all over the country. In terms of Florida, um, you know, the Biden campaign six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago would say, oh, you know, we're going to compete in Florida. 
they do not mention Florida anymore. The farthest they go is to say that they're they're still planning to compete in North Carolina. Florida was always a stretch. Uh, I don't know that ha adding a ballot measure is going to be enough um, to overcome real organizational challenges that Democrats have had on the ground in Florida for a generation. Well, meantime, House Speaker Mike Johnson is raising expect raising expectations for a vote on Ukraine funding when the House returns. Uh, next week, even at the risk of Johnson potentially losing his speakership, since Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has invoked that uh, measure that would allow her to call for a floor vote um, to, on his speakership, on his leadership. So here's what Johnson said to Fox in an interview yesterday about it. The Marjorie's a friend. She's very frustrated about, for example, the last appropriations bills. Guess what? So am I. As we discussed, Trey, these are not the perfect pieces of legislation that you and I and Marjorie would draft if we had the ability to do it differently. But with the smallest margin in U.S. history, we're sometimes going to get legislation that we don't like. And the Democrats know that when we don't all stand together with our razor thin majority, then they have a better negotiation position. So, Amy, is that enough to mollify his right flank? Um, I don't know that some of these uh, folks are mollifiable, if that's even a word. Um, and the point is not that about policy. This is really, I think, about the ability for many of these members just to show that they can do it. Um, and uh, Johnson doesn't have any margin, as he pointed out. He's got the smallest margin in history. There is a one-seat margin. Now, a call to vacate the chair, if indeed that comes to the floor with a one-seat uh, margin, that is courting disaster. One, it, this is not likely, but possibility that actually a Democrat wins the speakership. Um, but more than that, if we thought that the uh, McCarthy vote was drawn out or getting uh, Johnson into that job was was drawn out, just imagine how difficult this is going to be with the with one seat. What Johnson seems to be doing right now, though, is trying to mollify conservatives by saying, one, I'm going to put, maybe we'll put legislation in here, or put um, additional um, aspects into this legislation that deal with liquefied national natural gas. Um, also, let's make this more of a loan. Mm -hmm. Let's use um, assets, Russian assets we have taken in this country, use those to pay for it. But again, I don't, we know at the end of the day, he's going to need Democrats. This bill does not make it without Democrats. So whether it's mollifying them or not, it's still going to pass because Democrats decide to go along. And, and Speaker Johnson referred to those measures you mentioned as important innovations. Tam, House Republicans have blocked President Biden's request for additional Ukraine aid for nearly six months. How do you see this coming together? <laughs> It's not clear yet exactly how it will come together. Johnson is, he, he, he has taken on this remarkably pragmatic tone, uh, you know, laying out the challenges that exist in divided government when you have a very narrow margin. Um, it's not the kind of thing he would have said when he wasn't in leadership, but now he is in leadership. And I will say that um, he avoided a government shutdown. He has avoided a couple of other cliffs um, by innovating um, really not mm -hmm. actually changing the underlying numbers or changing the underlying thing that they ultimately agreed to, but by uh, changing a deadline or sort of rebranding um, funding the government. And, and that appears to be potentially what he is doing again. But as Amy says, in the end, uh, he would be very lucky if a majority of Republicans supported Ukraine funding or, or a broader supplemental, uh, national security supplemental. He would be very lucky if a majority of Republicans supported it. He's going to need Democrats in order for it to pass. Well, in the time that remains, let's talk about the 2024 race, because President Biden, fresh off that record-breaking fundraiser in New York, his campaign released a digital ad we can put up now, which really is making a direct appeal to Nikki Haley supporters. This is a, obviously a coalition of Republicans and moderates who were turned off by Donald Trump. Are there enough Republicans in the middle who are, are winnable by President Biden, or are these folks really just Democrats, as the Trump campaign has said? Yeah, I think that when you look at the group of people that voted for Nikki Haley in the primaries, they probably fall into three categories. One, never going to ever, ever vote for Donald Trump, probably didn't vote for him in 2020. And then there's a the group of, I really would like somebody other than Donald Trump, but I'll probably end up voting for him. 
And then there's the question, and I, I was talking to people today trying to figure out how big is that group of people of those who I voted for Donald Trump in 2020 and I don't want to vote for him again. I think the key for the Biden campaign isn't necessarily that they win them over, but even if those voters show up and skip the top of the ticket, vote third party, or maybe not go to the polls at all, that's a vote for Biden because it's a vote that Trump got last time. How does the Biden campaign see it? Right, and, and I will go to the Michigan primary where Nikki Haley got uh, more than 25% of the vote. Now, some of those people probably were Democrats, but not all of them. And you saw similar numbers in every state. Um, the, the Biden campaign is aiming for addition. Uh, rather than subtraction or rather than keeping things where they are. Uh, as that ad points out, Trump has, in his rhetoric, publicly at least, uh, said, you know, if you, do, if you wanted Nikki Haley, then you aren't, you aren't, right. you know, you're not MAGA, you're not me. Um, and so the Biden campaign is targeting that ad very specifically to areas where Nikki Haley got a lot of votes. Tim Keith and Amy Walter, thanks as always. You're welcome. <laughs> The program SNAP, formerly known as Food Stamps, is one of the nation's largest welfare systems, helping to feed more than 40 million low-income Americans. But for people in need, what that assistance looks like and who can access it varies greatly. Laura Barone-Lopez and producer Maya Lene Bura have this report, the final part in our series, America's Safety Net. For single mother Betsy Cruz, every trip to the grocery store is a tightrope walk. I always have to calculate down to the penny because when I get to that register, <laughs> I don't need any surprises because if it comes over then the amount that I have, I, I have to ask them to put it back. That amount is usually $56 a month, the total benefit she and her 21-year-old son Colton receive from SNAP, the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Is it enough to support and cover your food costs? No, it's not. You go to the grocery store and you come out with maybe three or four bags and that's it. It's, that's it for the month. Hi, how are you? To bridge the gap, Cruz gets help from food banks like this one near her home in Gilbert, South Carolina. She says she's grateful, but she can't rely on this help for healthy food. Most of the stuff that you get at the food banks are like very high carbureted or starchy items. And you know, my son's a diabetic, but we have to use it, you know, we have no choice. This struggle is new for Cruz. She worked a steady job as a government meat inspector for nearly three decades. But she was forced to retire early and take a reduced pension after her son's struggles with the developmental and behavioral disability worsened. You know, it's not that I don't want to work, it's I can't. Yeah, you have no choice right now. I have no choice. I'm a mother first. And it's been 21 years of it. He has to come first. The Cruz family is not unique. About 90% of SNAP recipients live in households with older adults, children, or someone with a disability. To qualify for SNAP, a family of two in South Carolina must make less than $25,700 a year. In 2022, about 600,000 people, 12% of the state's population, were on SNAP. That reflects the national picture. We must distribute more food to the needy. Through a food stamp started in 1964 as a key part of President Lyndon B. Johnson's war on poverty, aimed at feeding low-income Americans. As the program expanded, rising sharply after economic downturns like the Great Recession and later the COVID-19 pandemic, it's become a target for conservative lawmakers who argue the country can't afford a welfare program that costs more than $100 billion annually. The bill is passed. In last year's debt ceiling agreement, Republicans in Washington Sorry, negotiated a raise in the age limit for SNAP's work requirement from 49 to 54. And states, too, have experimented with more stringent SNAP requirements. For nearly a decade here in Kansas, Republican legislators have passed laws restricting who qualifies for food assistance, from implementing higher work requirements to forcing people to apply for child support. Kansas is one of five states that make single parents seek child support in order to receive SNAP benefits. I think it's an absolutely good policy. Comments on the minutes?
Republican Representative Francis Awerkamp is the chair of the Kansas House Committee on Welfare Reform. It's an opportunity to find that other parent and make sure they're doing their duty so that that child and the custodial parent, typically the mother, has the resources they need to kind of have it run a stable life. It seemed like a very drastic move just to feed my family. In 2017, six months into a pregnancy, Cecilia Douglas's partner unexpectedly abandoned her and her two daughters. The Kansan had just taken a pay cut to focus on her pregnancy, and she says her ex left her with crippling debt. When I found myself single, uh, there were a lot of financial responsibilities that were left on my shoulders, and it was very difficult uh, to recover from that financially. After giving birth, she decided to apply for SNAP and quickly realized that to enroll, she would be required to apply for child support. It was an immediately a moment of pause because I knew that my intention was not to rely on this assistance longer than I absolutely needed. You tell me when to let go. For Douglas, that meant opening a case against her newborn son's absent father and working with the Department for Children and Families to establish a child support order in court a daunting prospect. I felt that if I applied, it would create an unhealthy environment for my son, but also my older daughters. Weighing her options, Douglas chose to go without. It's, it's heartbreaking when your child comes to you and says, Mom, I'm hungry, and the only thing you have to feed them is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Chairman Awerkamp notes parents can apply for exemptions from the rule if pursuing child support could create a dangerous situation for them or their children. If there is good cause for an exemption, the exemptions are granted. But an exemption requires official evidence, like a police report or witness statement. This doesn't affect the non-custodial parent. This is affecting the, the mom and the kids. Who do you have packing it? This Karen week? Siebert is a policy advisor for Harvesters, one of Kansas's largest food bank networks. She supports efforts to repeal the requirement. The child support services has many levers by which to get child support. They have, they can garnish wages. They can do all sorts of things. Bringing food assistance in as a weapon is what we really have a problem with. Siebert says she sees the effect of these kinds of requirements up close at the food pantries her organization serves. The effect of all of these restrictions is that people are no longer on these programs or can't access these programs, and so they're turning to the charitable sector. When asked about some criticism of the state's restrictions on food assistance, Chairman Awerkamp said the policies are about creating, quote, a life of self-sustainability. I think it's so important to understand the spirit of these programs. What are they for? It's not to keep people on food welfare. It's actually to help them move off. Kansas ranks third from the bottom in access to SNAP, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And experts say three in 10 Kansans who would otherwise be eligible for the benefit do not receive it, largely because of state policies. Despite that, Kansas's food stamp reforms, particularly its time limits for the benefit, have been held up as a model by right-wing groups. And nearly a dozen states have made changes based on the ones in Kansas. They tend to go to state legislatures where they might have a receptive audience. Ed Bolin is the director of SNAP State Strategies at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a progressive think tank. We've seen troubling indications that folks are losing benefits uh, without any positive um, outcomes. With this year's election, SNAP may soon be on the line. Former President Donald Trump proposed major cuts to food assistance while in office and has nodded again towards welfare restrictions on the campaign trail. So first of all, there is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements, in terms of cutting, and in terms of also uh, the theft and the, the bad management of entitlements. Bolin worries that further restrictions to SNAP would hurt America's poorest. The independent and sort of academic research has increasingly shown that those time limits don't work, that the only real outcome is less SNAP participation. And hopefully we can get past uh, the idea of threatening to take away food assistance from these folks in order to get them into work. Back in South Carolina with the nation's patchwork of food assistance programs, Betsy Cruz is glad her family can access the benefit but it's still a struggle to put food on the table. 
Yesterday, I spent two cents over. I was digging through my purse trying to find two pennies just to pay the rest of my snap. What does that feel like? It's indescribable. I just feel like trash. That I'm here for a free handout and I'm just nothing to this country. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Laura Barone Lopez in Gilbert, South Carolina. Yeah. You can find more of our coverage of America's yeah. safety net online. That's at pbs.org slash newshour. One artist has taken ever popular designer handbags to a whole new level, transforming artwork into accessory. As Pamela Watts of Rhode Island PBS Weekly reports, instead of his creations hanging on the wall, he decided to put them right in your hand. This story is part of our arts and culture series, Canvas. Twenty-two years ago, if someone had told me I would be making purses from my artwork, I don't know if I would have been happy hearing that. Now, I'm living the dream. The dream for Rhode Island artist Kent Stetson is being a designer of handbags. Whimsical, colorful, topical. They are all made by hand in his mill workshop and sold in hundreds of boutiques worldwide. The purses are clutched by celebrities such as Martha Stewart, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Megan Thee Stallion. Not only do his bags star on the red carpet, they fly down the runway. These are not your mother's pocketbooks. They are a fusion of art and accessory. I think in terms of art, it's interactive, it's modular. I think it speaks in kind of an interesting way. And an interesting twist carried Stetson into the world of high fashion accessories. Stetson grew up in this cabin on a working horse farm in New Hampshire. He studied studio art and philosophy at Brown University and started out creating these digital hybrid paintings. So computer generated paintings at the time, we called it new media. Today, I think it's just called digital art. Um, and so these are very colorful, abstract pieces. But Stetson admits he was unsuccessful selling his modern art, so he pivoted. His plan B translated to in the bag. I worked at a shoe store at the time, though, and I had a gift for convincing people to buy shoes and handbags that they didn't particularly need, and so I connected the dots. How did you land on purses as the frame for your artwork? Of all things you could have picked. It was a way to package my art in a format that had some use. A handbag gave me much more license to be fun than I ever felt I had permission to do with a piece hanging on the wall. And so almost instantly, I made pieces that were a little bit irreverent and tongue in cheek and funny. Funny as in notoriously tasteful. Stetson's popular confections feature donuts, animal crackers, sushi, and even Rhode Island's famous New York System wieners. Three all the way. New York System is an iconic Rhode Island comfort food, um, and so we had to translate it into a bag. Stetson says when you carry one of his designer handbags, it starts a conversation and might make a friend. Whether it's one of his doggy bags or a selection from his bar cart of popular cocktails. They're a statement piece. It's an exclamation point on your outfit. I mean, it does not get the silent treatment. When you carry one of my pieces, it gets acknowledged. Kent Stetson's signature handbags, which sell for between $150 and $300, support a number of charitable causes. One style references the lace collar of late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. When she passed, um, Mariska Hargitay used this bag on Law & Order Special Victims Unit. Just got an alert. Irene is building. Okay, Kat, uh, you and I will go up. The sales for this piece sort of went haywire, um, and so we donate the proceeds to the ACLU. Others may tote an alligator handbag supporting Everglades preservation. Everything start to finish is done right here. Stetson says making each purse takes 50 steps and three days to complete. First, he creates an image, formats it on his computer, prints and laminates the canvas. But while the process begins with high-tech innovation, the rest is old world craftsmanship, hand tracing and hand sewing. In general, Stetson's signature bags are slim envelope styles. 
A lot of people look at it and say, I can't get anything in this bag. <laughs> what do you say? It's a fun little going out bag. Listen, if I made a larger bag, I'd have to leave Rhode Island. We're the smallest state in the country. I gotta be making small bags. Describe what it is you want people to see in this form of art. Well, I think I, I want people to know that I made this with love and a sense of joy, and I know that it's going to make an outing just that much more fun. It's come from my hands, my studio. I sign inside each piece as we sew them up. And so I want people to feel like they have a real connection to the creation of this piece, where it came from. And I think this is sort of like the farm to table version of personal accessories. Accessories that will do all the talking. People are going to say something. You're going to light up the room. So if you want to be left alone, if you want a chill, low-key evening, do not carry one of my pieces. <laughs> For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Pamela Watts in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And that's the News Hour for tonight. I'm Jeff Bennett. And I'm Amna Navaz. On behalf of the entire News Hour team, thank you for joining us. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by. On an American Cruise Line's journey along the Columbia and Snake Rivers, travelers retrace the route forged by Lewis and Clark more than 200 years ago. American Cruise Line's fleet of modern riverboats travel through American landscapes to historic landmarks where you can experience local customs and cuisine. American Cruise Lines, proud sponsor of PBS NewsHour. Certified financial planner professionals are proud to support PBS NewsHour. CFP professionals are committed to acting in their clients' best interest. More information at letsmakeaplan.org. The Candida Fund committed to advancing restorative justice and meaningful work through investments in transformative leaders and ideas. More at CandidaFund.org. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at MacFound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions, This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.